Welcome to another episode of In The Zone. I am your host, Chris Broussard. We've got an outstanding show for you today. Ralph Sampson is in the house. I can't wait to interview the big man who was just tremendous. For all you millennials that don't remember him, you got to go check out some of his stats, some of his highlights. Only injuries could stop Ralph Sampson. And then, of course, we got Jason McIntyre stopping by for an episode of Knockdown J. But first, you know I have to hit you with a list. So here is this week's top 10. What a week for the LA Lakers. Kobe Bryant's two jerseys retired at the Staples Center. I was there, the atmosphere was tremendous, and everybody afterwards was talking about where does Kobe Bryant rank all time? Which got me to thinking, let me put together my top 10 list. So checking in at number 10, it is none other than a Kobe rival, Tim Duncan of the San Antonio Spurs, five-time NBA champion, best power forward of all time, the anchor of what became a tremendous long-running dynasty in San Antonio. At number nine, Larry Bird, six foot nine inches, tremendous three-point shooter, second best shooter in history, according to me, behind Steph Curry. He was the precursor to all of these stretch fours. He was a three man, also a four man. And by the way, the greatest trash talker in history. At number eight, Bill Russell. I couldn't deny 11 rings. Some people might think I put him too low. Didn't have the great individual numbers offensively, but arguably the greatest defensive player in the league battling Wilt Chamberlain, Nate Thurman, Walt Bellamy, all these great centers and he was winning every single time. At number seven, it's your man of the day of the week, Kobe Bryant. Yes, Kobe Bryant, 81 points in a game, nine straight 40 point games, 62 points in three quarters. That was one more than his opponent's whole team, the Dallas Mavericks, and of course, five NBA championships. Two times he repeated as champion, Kobe Bryant, you can't deny it. His teammate at number six, Shaquille O'Neal. I picked Shaq over Kobe because if I had to choose one to start a team with, it would be the big man, Shaq Diesel. Absolutely dominant for the bulk of his career, the first several, you know, decade and a half. But then that three year stretch where he three-peated as champion with Kobe, 36 points, 15 rebounds in the finals. Then at number five, Wilt Chamberlain. Here's what I call the NBA record book, the biography of Wilt Chamberlain. I mean, that's how dominant this dude was statistically. 50 points, 26 rebounds, a game one year. Then the next season, 44, 45 points, 24 rebounds a game. I mean, his numbers are astronomical. We will never see them passed or equaled again. And of course, the 100 points in one game. At number four, Magic Johnson, best passer of all time, the precursor to all these big point guards, even guys like James Harden, who really aren't true point guards. We had never before, Magic, seen a guy that size running the show and, and doing the magnificent no look behind the back, between the legs, passes that he did. Do yourself a favor and check out a Magic Johnson highlight. Oh, he played 12 years, made it to the finals nine of those years, and won five times. At number three, his teammate, <laughs> Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Six MVP awards, that's the most in history. Six NBA championships and the greatest shot of all time. The sky hook was unstoppable. It allowed him to play well past his prime at an effective level. So, so much so that he was 41 years old when he won his last championship. At number two, LeBron James. Yes, already. Look, he's played, he's in his 15th year. He's already played more games than Magic, Larry Bird, and Michael Jordan. If he retired tonight, he would still have a full, outstanding career. Three titles. I mean, the size of Carl Malone passes like a point guard. Now he's hitting three-pointers. Can't shoot free throws that well, but hey, he's human. LeBron James, number two. And number one, of course, the GOAT. Just about everybody's GOAT, Michael Jordan, six-time NBA champion, 
10 times scoring leader, 10 straight times led the league in scoring, broke all types of conventional wisdom. You can't build a dynasty around a shooting guard. Oh, well, here comes Jordan. You can't lead the league in scoring and win championships. Oh, but here comes Jordan. 30 points a game to him, which was his career average, was like what other all-stars did at 20 points. He could get 30 points in his sleep, average 37 points one year, 35 points another year, 32 points, eight assists and eight rebounds another year. Michael Jordan, the all-time GOAT, but no surprise there. I'm joined by Hall of yeah. Famer Ralph Sampson. It's great to have you here in the zone. Yeah, I love to be in it. I wish I could get back in the zone. It's good. <laughs> Basketball's on that end, so it's good. When I saw we we saw each other at the airport about a year ago, and we started talking. We had lunch together, and I was saying I really wanted to get you on the podcast because to me you're like you were like a forerunner to all of these seven footers <laughs> now that play on the perimeter. You know, you could dribble, you could shoot jump shots. And at the time when you were doing it, people, some people kind of looked down at it. Mm -hmm. You know, they wanted you in the post. Right, right. Talk about that and, and how you – do you see yourself as kind of a precursor to these guys? Well, people have said that time and time again, and I didn't pay attention to it over the year, but now I do a little bit more. But, you know, I had a coach Bill Fitch and the crew. You know, we had Carol Dawson that was a Converse rep, you know, <laughs> as assistant coach. And then Rudy Tom John was, was a scout. <laughs> and but Rudy never wanted to be in practice. He wanted to get away from the okay. politics of everything. But you know, you big guy, you shoot a three pointer. Like get your tail in the post. <laughs> you can't shoot a three pointer. Seven footer, you shouldn't be able to shoot a three pointer. Seven foot, you can't dribble. If you turn it over, then what happens? But you know, my mentality is I learned from high school because of the boxing one and his own defense. I never get the ball. I had to go get it and dribble up. My high school coach would. Do, let me do it in practice every day. So you would bring the ball I, up court? I would court. bring the ball up the court just because I couldn't get the ball. And then, you know, because I get mad, and then in the game, I turn it over and, like, yeah. you know, stop. So if you're going to do it, we're going to teach you how to do it in practice. Okay. So it started in high school. And then in college with the same thing, trying to be able to shoot, you know, Coach Allen was like, let me get the first long shot out of my system, you know, <laughs> to get it out of the way. So it, I just kind of evolved. And then the NBA, you know, uh, we just saw highlights and trying to figure some stuff out as well. I mean, being able to dribble, handle the ball, because you, you're not going to get it any other way. And that's yeah. the evolution of the day's game. Big guys, there's no post-ups. Uh, the game is a three-point game. Uh, and everybody's you know, wants to shoot a three, and you, you got to shoot it efficiently and effectively. So it's evolved. And I wish I was playing now. I was going to ask you, you, would you have preferred to play today versus the era oh, you played I, in? I mean, I love both eras, but uh, you know, I guess with the skill set that I had – you know, what could I have done today? I don't know. But you know, I look at I could post up. I could shoot a three. Yeah. I could dribble. Um, you know, the fan block shots run the court. I mean, it's a fun time to play uh, the game of basketball. And the skills I had, I, I, I probably would have would have hopefully been pretty good right now. So I don't know how closely you follow the guys, but you got Christos Porzingis, 7'3", mm -hmm. in New York. Giannis Adetokounmpo in yes. Milwaukee. Uh, Joel Embiid, who even shoots some threes. Mm -hmm. Um, Kevin Durant even is basically yep. a seven footer. D who do you think you would have played like if of those guys, or maybe there's somebody else out there? Well, I like uh, all of them have a different. Those guys you mentioned have a different perspective, a different ability to play the game. I love Kevin Durant's game, but he doesn't have a post up game typically. Uh, Nabib has a post up game, and he has a little bit of an outside yeah. game, but more of a post up game. And nobody's able to stop him on twelve because of his size. Um, but the Greek freak is the one that you watch every day. Once he gets that jump shot a little bit better, he can post up, he can run the court. But his, I watched him play the other day, and his tenacity, just going to get a loose ball. Yeah. Uh, being active is, is a little bit better than most of those guys right now. And I think over the next year or so, whatever, you can see him evolve and see how really, really good he is. Who do you, if you had to choose one big man in the league today, who would it be? Uh, I think it's a combination of the Greek freak uh, and what he's able to do and the beeb and what he's able to do if okay. he can stay healthy. Again, Kevin Durant is, is the top one right now, uh, yeah. big guy, I think. Uh, but he, he probably doesn't consider himself as a big guy. But as size-wise, he is. Yeah. But his, his demeanor, his, his tenacity, his heart, uh, you can't beat that. Now, your perimeter skills enabled you and Hakeem Olajuwon to play well together. Mm -hmm. Um and I, I say all the time, I, you had about three and a half healthy years in mm -hmm. the NBA. I think your injury, it not only obviously changed the course of your career, 
But I really think it changed the course of the NBA history <laughs> because in your third year, your second year with Akeem, you guys beat the Showtime Lakers mm-hmm. four to one right. in the Western Conference Finals. Got beat by Boston in '86 in the mm-hmm. Finals four to two. But do you feel that like the Lakers went on to win two more titles, '87 and '88? With you guys healthy, I don't know if they would have done that. How how good could that team have been if you had remained healthy? Well, yeah, me remaining healthy was one of the keys. But you have to understand, we had no point guards. Yeah, was it Robert Reed? Robert Reed was our point forward. Yeah, that, that, that point forward evolved at that point in time because we had our point guards go down with some Lucas, personal incidents. Yep. And so, you know, Rodney McCray and Robert Reed was our point guards. That's right. Uh, Mitchell Wiggins played with us as well. And, and uh, so we had no point guard. So we would have had a, a point guard and I'd stay healthy. I don't think too many people would have stopped us at that point in time. But, again, the evolution of the game today with big guys, you know, I'm the first guy to bring weights to the NBA locker room. You were? Yeah. Really? Houston had no weights. Oh, you lift weights, you get big and bulky, yeah, yeah, yeah. you'll, you know, you'll just jump, it'll mess your jump shot up, whatever. So if I had maintained that physical skill level on and off the court and with the evolution of what they have today, it would have been a different story. Wow. Now, that, that 86 Boston team that beat you guys, a lot of people think that might be the best team ever. Do you feel that way or what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, they played well. I mean, Parrish, Mikhail Bird, obviously unstoppable as far as uh, the way they played. I don't think they're the best ever, but they can rank in the t- probably the top five. You know, if you look at the history of the league itself, um, those three guys, all Hall of Fame guys, played r- well. Uh, but, you know, Magic will say, you know, since we beat them, it made him more hungry to come back, and they ended up winning two in a row. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So it made him hungry the, the following year to go back and then have to play Boston again and defeat them. So... Uh, that era, Lakers, Celtics, obviously was uh, the dominant team. But, but best ever is hard for me to figure out who's the best ever or the best team ever. You played against all of the best players in the 80s, including Michael Jordan mm-hmm. in college, even in pros too. But who do you think is the, the best player of all time? Well, you know, I, I, I got to stay with the big guy. So if, depending on how you define the best, if it's championships, it's Bill Russell. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Coach, <laughs> and, I mean, so in, in, the, in the era he played in, he played against Wilt. You know, played in that era. So I think the number one is Bill Russell. Uh, and then you can kind of pick and choose who's second, third after that. And then, you know, I always like Wilt uh, just because of you know, Wilt average double double, yeah, average 20 numbers. rebounds. Yeah. I don't care what era you played in with him. I mean, you can average what he did. Uh, so from a big guy, I, I like the big guys. You played Jordan in college. Did you have? I mean, he obviously was good in college, but did you? Could you foresee what he became at all at that time? Well, I tell a story of of you know we play them down in Carolina, and he steals the ball from my point guard. They were down, and uh, they put him on the point guard to defend, and so he steals the ball a couple of times, and he goes down oh, and dunks it, <laughs> and, and right, and then they they get up in the game, and they end up winning the game. So you can see flashes of it. And I know he said all the time that the only one that held him back was Dean Smith. Yeah, yeah. But when you had Jordan, Perkins, and you had those guys, cast of characters on the team, that, you know, it's not enough balls for all those guys to, to play, especially in the college game. Yeah. But you could see flashes of it, but you didn't expect it, obviously, to be who he became after that. And I tell people all the time, he, you know, he could score 60 points against Boston and still lose. And that was great, but until he understood the game itself mm-hmm. and then they got some pieces around him with the triangle and started to make his teammates better, then it became, to me, that's Michael Jordan. Not, not the before that, before he you know, scored 60 yeah, points and yeah, had yeah. the shoes and all that kind of stuff as well. That's just for Slash. But when he started to learn the game and understand it, I think that's the Michael Jordan that people can respect. How good, because I don't think people fully appreciate how good Larry Bird was. Um, you played against him, obviously. Mm-hmm. How good was he? Uh, Larry, you know, Rodney McRae would have to guard him, uh, and you know we would we would try to beat Larry to the gym. We go to Boston, played in the garden. You know, you go up to the service elevator, that had rats and roaches and all the kind of stuff. You go up and you go in the locker room. It's hot. You know, they yeah, did all their yeah. tricks, but Larry would always come to the game. You know, a couple hours early to get his shots up. So we'd try to beat him. Roddy and, and, and Robert Reed would try to get to the gym and beat him. They never could. Because he was in the gym a couple hours before the game started. Wow. And working on his game, working his shots, getting his mindset right. So I think mentally tough. And, you know, he wasn't a, a great athlete. Yeah. But I think he was mentally tough to know what his skill set, what he could do, what he couldn't do. And he used it 
to the best of his ability and became, you know, a Hall of Famer and one of the best players that ever played the game. Now he's – people have told me he was the biggest trash talker <laughs> ever too. Did you hear him on the court talking trash? He would talk <laughs> You know, he, just, just all day long he was, you know, saying your face or, you know, I'm coming at you. But very quietly. It wasn't flamboyant like a Gary Payton or somebody like yeah, that. Yeah. But, you know, he would whisper and talk to you and, you know, say, I'm coming to get you or whatever. I got this, whatever. He would fake the ball one way and say in your face and just stuff like that. But, again, that's this tough mindset he had. Who was the toughest player you played against? Oh, I tell people in that era, and that question has been asked a number of times, I think the toughest player for me was myself. Okay. Because one night you got to play Kareem. One night you're playing Robert Pears. One night you're playing Moses Malone. One night you're playing Tree Rollins. One night you're playing, you know, James Donaldson. So yeah. if you wasn't up every night mentally, that you would get your tail beat. So all those guys would get. But I didn't like like the Buck Williams. I didn't like the undersized big man. Okay. Uh, the Maurice Lucases that you know were power for us to play center because yeah. they wanted to beat you up every night. So I hated those guys uh, to play against. But I love the I love the centers because I can run them up and down the court. Uh, Artist Gilmore has become a good friend. I hated to play against Artist because he was the strongest human being that you could possibly ever see. Really? He would take Akeem Olajuwon and put his left hand on him and just pick him up and move him anywhere he wanted <laughs> to move him because he was that strong. So Artist, you know, strong human, love him to death, but uh, but I, we always wanted to dunk on Artist. Uh, Rodney McCray, because he just was a big guy, right? <laughs> and, and he would take you out. But Rodney McCray said one game that I'm going, I need to dunk on Artist Gilmore, and he finally got him. But it uh, took him, you know, a couple years to do that. But, you know, Artis is a great, great guy, but he's one of the strongest people I, I know. You mentioned all those centers. I mean, that was the best era of big men. And then, you know, Patrick Ewing and others came in later. How do you – can you even compare how a teams back then would play against the teams today, like who might win a game of the best teams back then versus the best teams today with the three-pointer? Well, I'm sure that uh, – um, you know, you look at the Steph Curry and the three-point shot, whatever, and he can shoot it from half court. Yeah. Uh, but can you imagine out there Thomas defending Steph Curry or a Gary <laughs> and, Payton? And they let you get physical. Right, back and then, gets physical yeah. back then. A greatest player there is, but you know, hand-checking and all this kind of stuff, well, I don't think they would have done what they do today, but they would have been still effective and they would have played well. But I think the teams back then would have killed because of the mindset, because mm. uh, of the mental toughness. You know, I tell people all the time, when I played against the Lakers and they had Maurice Lucas, he would come, jump ball, and just hit me in the chest, take an elbow, big fella, I'm, I'm here. Just from the game ain't started. <laughs> you know, so those guys would have never, you know, you do that today, like, okay, great, what's going on? It's a flagrant. Uh, exactly. <laughs> but the mindset back then, I think, is tougher than the guys today. Now, you guys had super teams, too. I mean, you and Hakeem mm-hmm. is a super team. Obviously, the Lakers, the mm-hmm. Celtics, the Sixers had great players. Yep. How do you, not on the court, but just do you think the super teams today are similar or is it a whole different dynamic because of the way they come together? Well, it, 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 that's why it's a super team because the way the structure, there's not a, enough teams with great players. So now you have to I become a super team. Back then, you can imagine, you, you had three good players, Magic, Bird, you know, Worthy. with the teams, Kareem, yeah. Yeah. James Worthy, Byron Scott, Michael Cooper, super team. The, the Celtics would – Parrish and, and Mikhail Ainge, Dennis Johnson, uh, the Sixers with Julius and, you know, they got Moses. And, and they, so there was always super teams back yeah. then. Atlanta with Tree Rollins, Dominique, uh, you know, they had super teams back then. It, it just the evolution of the day's game and social media and things that's happening that now Kevin Durant leaves and goes to Golden State. Yeah. Now that's a super team. Or LeBron leaves and goes to Miami. That's a super team. Not too many teams have those type players anymore. Yeah. So it's kind of watered down today as far as the league standpoint, my concern. Uh, and the teams that, that, that don't have super players, you don't never hear about the Utahs. And they mm-hmm. can never build those super teams because there's not enough players that are yeah. super players at this point. How do you feel about what Kevin Durant did going to you know, a 73-win team and then finally winning a championship? Well, you know, not a lot of people liked it in the beginning, especially uh, the Oklahoma City Thunder. And I was telling people as well, like, can you imagine Oklahoma had Westbrook, Durant, and Harden? Uh, Whoever yeah. the general manager there should have been far a long time ago, right? <laughs> and so I, I'd, have put, I'd have kept trying to keep that together from that standpoint. But, you know, KD was like, to me, let me see what this year is going to be like before he left Oklahoma City. If we can't win, you're not bringing me any other help. i gotta, I got to figure out I gotta, time for me to make a move. He makes a move. No one really likes it, but they put play really well together. But in the mm-hmm. finding moments in the playoffs where he had to show up, 
he showed yeah. up. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I gained much more respect. I respect him anyway, but I gained much more respect then because he showed up, he played MVP. He did what he had to do. He won a championship. That's what it's about. You and uh, King were dominant. Mikhail and Parrish dominant. You know, even David Robinson and Tim Duncan later mm-hmm. were dominant. I'm looking at New Orleans, DeMarcus Cousins, <laughs> Anthony Davis. They're just struggling to stay up 500. Um, why do you think – I mean, those are two of the best big men in the league. Why do you think they can't be dominant? I think they can be. Uh, I, I love Alvin Gentry as a coach. But you got to put them in the right situation. Um, you know, now the game has evolved from a post-up game to a three-point game. Um, um, Buggy, which everybody called him, you know, wants to shoot the three, wants to have the ball. Anthony Davis has evolved as a superstar. It's taken him a number of years to do that. Somebody has to step up. Somebody, you know, they, they need an old school vet on that team to tell those guys, let's go play. And then they need some other pieces around them. And they need to have a different system, I think, of play so that they can be dominant. The market, and, you know, in New Orleans is a little soft probably, but uh, they should be one of the dominant teams in the league. And in the first couple of years playing together, they have to understand that Manny King kind of knew our, our skill sets from the mm-hmm. beginning. And we it took us a year, and then after that it was a wrap. But uh, I think those guys have to be a little bit more hungrier and know that we can take anybody out every night if we want to play. Yeah. But, again, it's game situation down the stretch of the fourth quarter. Somebody's got to put those guys in a situation where they can win. And maybe they don't understand game situation. Maybe they need a better point guard. Uh, maybe they need a vet. You know, it's a coaching situation. So I don't know all the pieces down there that make sense, but they should be one of the dominant teams in the league. Nowadays, there's always talk about who's taking the last shot. It's, it's LeBron's got to take it or Durant or whoever. I think when you you hit one of the famous last shots mm-hmm. when you guys beat the, the Lakers in uh, 86 in the conference finals, but I'm sure every time it was a close game, it didn't go to you. It could have went to Hakeem, right. could have went to somebody else. Do you think – Teams should do more of that, like just run a play or maybe that has options where anybody could get it or that they should always go to their best player. It's funny because uh, people today use all these analytics you know, in the arena and say, well, you should shoot the ball from here, you shoot the ball. And they don't use that down the stretch because it's reacting. But think about Michael Jordan when he you know, spread the court. He created shots for Steve Kerr. Yeah. Paxton, and look, dude, you were in that corner. That's a shot you want to make. I'm going to give you the ball. You better knock it down. And they did. So you got an old game situation. You're down 10. You're down five. Three minutes in the game, 24 second clock on, 10 seconds to go. Who's going to get the shot? There's got to be a set play. Look at the, the um, Houston Rockets last year with Harden down the stretch. That table of basketball is good during the season, mm-hmm. but down in the playoffs when you got to have a shot, somebody's going to turn it over nine times out of ten. The ball's going to be in the wrong hands with the wrong person because there's no set play. Yeah. And you're not going to get a rebound because you don't know when the ball is going to be shot. So you can't get an offensive rebound. The defense is going to get the ball, and they're going to throw a long pass out, and you're going to lose the game anyway. So um, that's the playoffs. That's what happens. Yeah. And then nobody ever – those those power teams, you got a Steph Curry, and those guys can, can knock down a shot. They understand the draw and kick and the give and go and the, and the pick and roll because they played it so, so well. But if you're down the stretch like LeBron the other day, he, he gets a lot of attention, but he had nobody around him that can take that last mm-hmm. shot. So he has to take it, and you know, nine times out of ten you can make it. But when you don't, it looks really bad. Do you think anybody's a threat to beat Golden State this year or can beat them? I think so. Um, I watched them play against Oklahoma City, and Oklahoma, they had they, everybody was ready to go, and they beat them. Uh, which they have to get their stuff together. But, you know, injuries is going to tell tell this mm-hmm. year, I think, because of the long games in the league and how, how long you play. So we'll see what happens in the playoff. But I think there are teams that can beat them. I think Houston can beat them if they play well. But it's a four-game series, you know. So can you make those adjustments in four-game series to be beat or not? And I think Steve Kerr and, and Steph and those guys are smart enough to make those adjustments. I don't know if Harden and Paul are ready to make those adjustments yet. It's been the first year to play together. And can Oklahoma City get their stuff together? And then there's always Popovich. Yeah. There's always Pop. <laughs> I mean, you know, this thing last year, what Ginobili did in that series against Harden, blocking the shot down the stretch, yeah. and Pop, can he knows how to make those adjustments. So I always watch him as quiet as he kept. They'll sneak in. They got Parker back. They got their, their nucleus back now. And let's see what they do in the next couple months. Uh, people say he modeled his game after Michael Jordan. I had one more Jordan question for you. Last question overall. 
I was reading on your Twitter that Jordan wanted to play with mm-hmm. you at Virginia. Right. But Virginia didn't really go scout him. <laughs> they just sent him like a form. That's what that's what it, when when we when we have talked about this a number of times. Say he wanted to come, he wanted to play at Virginia, but they didn't recruit him that hard. You know, we had um, a cast of characters that were coming in, but I don't. You know, I need to ask Coach Holland that question. Like, why, why did you recruit him a little bit harder? You know, to make make it sense, he would have came to Virginia, but um, I don't know if they thought he was ever going to come out of Carolina. Uh, from what what and I he understand, he wasn't like the highest no. recruited guy overall. No, I mean, I mean it's what is. Freshman year, he got cut from a team. Yeah, and, yeah. And then he, he tried to figure it out. So he wasn't recruited early. But uh, I think from what I can remember, they said he, w- he probably wasn't ever going to come out of North Carolina. Do you know him well? Like, are you guys keep in touch? I mean, are you really close? Yeah, every now and then. We, we, I mean, we see each other on the circuit. Um, one of um, Fred Whitfield, that's the president of the, yeah. of, the, of the team, is a personal friend of mine. And I introduced Fred and Michael. Oh, really? A lot of years ago. Oh, wow. Uh, so they became friends. And so we talk. I talk to Fred every now and then as far as the team. And I think, like, man, you, your team sucks. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I know, but we're working on it. We're working on it. <laughs> so we, we can brass each other, you know, a little bit about that every now and then. So, I, you know, I used to go down there to a, one or two games a year. Just haven't done it in the last couple of years. But we'll see each other respect. And, you know, we, we talk about basketball and just kind of BS around a little bit. I'm told he is absolutely the most competitive person you could ever meet. Is that your experience? Absolutely. Um, you know, I can recall at dinner, and we had this little private set with uh, Achievement Unlimited Basketball uh, School that they have down in, uh, in North Carolina now, uh, 30-some years moving. It was me, Michael, Donnie Simpson, a couple other people, and we were talking about cars, and I was like, okay, great. I'm a Porsche guy. Michael and Donnie had Bentleys, and, you know, they're racing Bentleys. They were talking about, my car is faster than yours. <laughs> I'm like, dude, what makes it different? As long as you don't wreck in that car. You know, Michael had the motorcycle, whatever. And Donnie said, they were going back and forth, like, let's go race right now. It was like 12 o'clock at night. Like, dude, you're not going to race tonight. <laughs> you're not going to race tomorrow. So very, very competitive, you know, at every, I think, thing that he does or represents. He had that competitive spirit. Great. Well, Ralph, I thank you for your time. It was Appreciate great to it. talk no, with you. Anytime. Great to interview love you. It. And uh, good luck going forward. Thanks so much. And, and likewise to you. Thank you. All right, here we are for our final segment of the day. As always, it is Knockdown Jay. I bring in my man, Jason McIntyre, who gives me his best opinions, and I knock them down like bowling pins each and every week on In The Zone. I'm about to go back to back. Last week I won. This week I'm going to win again who like the Warriors. Who tells you you win? What do you mean? Like, I, I don't <laughs> the know crowd, who's telling The crowd, the audience you. on yeah, YouTube. You, are, you the obviously comments. aren't reading the comments. But. All right, Chris, first I want to commend you on a very nice job on your top 10 all-time players list. However, I was about to say, I know there's a but. There is a big but. You got to have Tim Duncan ahead of Kobe Bryant. I'm sorry. Listen, Kobe had a tremendous career. He would have been my 11th choice. But Tim Duncan is certainly (laughs) ahead of Kobe Bryant. I'll hit you with a couple quick things, and I'll let you try to rebut them. Uh, NBA Finals MVP awards. Tim Duncan, three. Kobe Bryant, two. NBA regular season MVP awards. Tim Duncan, two. Kobe Bryant, one. Years you missing. Have Tim the Tim Duncan ahead of Shaq? Just wondering. Uh, I do not. Okay, Shaq has Well, well one don't MVP interrupt. We'll, we'll get to Kobe Tim in a second. Tim Duncan has two. So the just Spurs, throw that last point out. No, no, we will come back to that. Out. <laughs> Going back to Kobe versus Duncan. Tim Duncan never missed the playoffs once in his career. Tim Duncan's teams never won under 50 games, with the exception of the lockout year where there was only 60 games or what have you. Tim Duncan has to be ahead of Kobe Bryant. That's it? That's all you have? That's all I need. (laughs) Well, they both won five titles. They did. Tim Duncan had three Hall of, two Hall of Fame teammates for three of his, two of his titles, or three of his titles. Just remind me of their names. Manu Ginobili and Tony Parker. Yes. And then he had three, what looks like Kawhi Leonard looks on the to be on the path. A little early, but probably. A little I would not early, totally but, but probably, that. right? Okay. So three of them for one title. Uh, and then just one teammate, David Robinson, for his first title. Kobe Bryant had one Hall of Fame teammate for every one of his titles. Shaq, that's a heck of a teammate, heck but that's one Hall of Famer. And then Pau Gasol, another great teammate, but that's the only Hall of Famer on Kobe's last two peak. Here's another thing Kobe did that Tim Duncan did not. He repeated as a champion. And not only did he repeat, he did it twice. (laughs) Tim Duncan couldn't do it once. Kobe Bryant did it twice. 
Do you know the names of the players who have repeated in the last, since the NBA ABA merger in 1976? Let me let me read them off. Indulge for you. me. With LeBron James and Dwayne Wade. Oh yeah. Shaquille O'Neal and Kobe Bryant. Right. Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen. Hakeem Olajuwon. Isaiah Thomas. Magic and Kareem. That's an impressive list. That's, but to the do, and Kobe, of course. Kobe French. Bryant and Shaquille O'Neal and Kobe Bryant and Paul Gasol okay. did it. Not, then there's the little matter of, they both won a lot. Five rings, five rings. Right, right. Did Duncan ever score 81 points? <laughs> did Duncan ever score 40 points in nine straight games? Ooh. Did Duncan ever <laughs> outscore an entire team by himself? I don't 2005, so. the month game. was December. Was Kobe Bryant scored 62 points in three quarters. The Dallas Mavericks scored 61 wow. in three quarters. Wow. I mean. Regular season numbers. Way to go. Kobe. And you can't, don't get me winning because they both got their five rings. But you, now let's look at a few of the individual yes, things. Yes, let's focus and on you individual. you can't look at the ones that I just pointed out. You can't rebut those. Let me give you one more. Kobe Bryant had a 16-year stretch of outstanding basketball. Second year in the league, he makes the All-Star team. Mm. 17, he was the sixth man seven, on the Lakers that year. He started he one game made, in his second year. He made the All-Star second team. Second year in his league, Tim Duncan was the uh, uh, MVP me, of the let finals. Let me finish. He made the All-Star team. 17th year in the league, he averaged 27 points. Oh. So that's a 16-year. They get to the playoffs that year? year. Did, yes, they, they did. did. Okay, they that's went a around. 16-year stretch of outstanding individual play. Duncan was great too, but he only had a 13 year stretch when he was in his prime. Then he came back and had rebounded a couple years later with 17 points a game, but it's just I mean, if you want, listen, Kobe, Kobe was a scorer by nature. That's what he did. Tim Duncan was a rebounding machine. A did, did he ever time... lead the league in rebounding? He, no, he, no, come on, of course not. He was where there was Shaq. Come on, Shaq was the Shaq rebounder led, in the league. Shaq never led the league. Dw rebounder. Dwight Howard in his prime was was like an MVP candidate. There were well, other well, great well, centers. Well, 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 Kobe but, but was not. Just, he, but he's better than Kobe. Tim Why Duncan. The, Tim Duncan. The, the, what he did, he never led the league in it. Kobe, Kobe, Kobe Bryant was not even the best twice. shooting guard in the NBA history. Michael Jordan. We would agree well, on that. Of course. Tim yeah. Duncan, best power forward NBA history. Of course. Who, who, who's the argument? Don't I give know, me Carl Malone. No, no, no. Okay. I go with Listen, Duncan. Unless again. you count, some people would count Larry so, Bird as a power forward. I'd no, go, he was a small forward. McHale was a power but forward. I, but okay. I go with Again, with Duncan. You, individual games, Kobe was did, the did score. Did Duncan ever lead the league in anything? That's a great question. I don't know. Did he? No. Uh, I mean, he, all I know is he led the league in three NBA Finals MVP awards against Kobe Bryant. Okay, Kobe got zero. He was the second banana to Shaq. He got two. MVP yeah, when five. when he when he got Phil Jackson later on with Pau Gasol. Okay, that's fine. But a it's, lot of people would be second banana to Shaq, including a lot of people Duncan, because you said he's ranked below Shaq. Well, no, uh, in in terms of rebounding, yes. Oh, are you you want my all time top ten? No, not really. You know, okay, <laughs> all right, okay. I thought you. I think I just demolished. I, I, so head to head, argument. Tim Duncan. Finals MVP awards, more regular Th season that's MVPs. Fine. I, I just, you didn't say hey, Andre and Iguodala has a finals MVP award. Does that mean we're going to throw him in the Hall of Fame or I something? No, but he's got, we're not comparing that's him to Kobe. That's not how you we're measure the, the And they're the different positions. Players. Listen, a spirited argument, I'll applaud you, but there's yeah, no way yeah. Tim Duncan's ahead of Kobe Bryant. All right, <laughs> next topic. Uh, you are the number one OKC fan, I believe, in the building here at Fox Sports. I mean, you love you some Russell Westbrook. there's a bunch Westbrook. of haters up in this um, <laughs> So let me hit you with this statement. I don't believe Russell Westbrook will ever get back to a conference finals now that Tim, Kevin Durant is gone. And let me just hit you okay, only a couple things. Russell Westbrook's now 29 years old, okay? He's a 39% shooter this year with two great teammates, 30% from three. His game relies on athleticism, getting to the rim, thunderous dunks. He's 29. It's tough to keep that going, as we saw with Allen Iverson, getting into the lane, getting to the foul line. His style isn't conducive to longevity. And we, I, I told you, he can't shoot. I compare Russell Westbrook to Iverson. Iverson, at the age of 25, got to the finals, never got back. Dwight Howard, another great young player, Got to the finals, age 23, never got back. I don't think Russ gets back to the finals. 
I don't think he gets back to a conference finals. Very possible because obviously the Western Conference is stacked. It is. You know, Golden State's still a relatively young team. Everybody's in their prime. Houston doesn't appear to be going anywhere if Chris Paul stays there. Minnesota's coming. They're going to be, a, you know, it just keep As improving. long as Jimmy Butler stays. Yeah, yeah. And, and even without Butler, they're still going to have Carl Anthony Towns and Andrew, Andrew Wiggins and all that. So uh, that's possible. What I would say Oklahoma City has to do, I, th- I like your Iverson comparison. I think you heard me saying that before. So you, did, have you, you said stole that? it. You I, stole I, it for I, your I segment. I did not hear that. Um, but <laughs> I do think he's similar to Iverson. There's no question about it. And the Philadelphia 76ers, the, the best postseason run they had with Iverson when they made the finals against the Lakers was when they put the right pieces around him. Mm-hmm. Fewer things they had. They put grinders, defenders, spot-up shooters around Allen Iverson, guys who couldn't really create on their own offensively, so they were happy to play their role. Those are the types of players you need to put around Russell Westbrook. They Westland. tried that last put year. Put three and deep. No, they didn't, they didn't have any shooters last year. Well, that, Victor they, they Oladipo Victor was Oladipo. not a shooter it's last year. It's interesting that Victor Oladipo shooting well, it's, really it's well this It's called improvement. Year. He wasn't a great shooter in Orlando either before he got to Oklahoma City. So you put three and D shooters around Westbrook. I love Steven Adams with Westbrook, some defenders. And that Allen Iverson team had an all-time great coach in Larry Brown. Yes. No disrespect to Billy Donovan, but he's not an all-time great <laughs> I coach. love when people say not no disrespect because nah, you're about to he, disrespect Yeah, him. not at the NBA <laughs> level. And he's either going to have to improve and step it up or they're going to have to get a superb coach. But who's going to want to go there? Oh, a lot Listen, of people would want to If players are abandoning ship, Russell are you Westbrook. sure? Players are abandoning ship. Nobody wants to play with him. How, what, what coach one is going to want to go Isn't there? That one player? You're going to if Kevin you're a Durant, coach, who if else you're abandoned well, you? I mean, Victor Oladipo didn't leave by choice. He they dealt traded. him because he didn't fit alongside Westbrook. Paul George, we'll see. He's about to leave. Well, we'll he's see what happens. To Carmelo Anthony, to let's see LA. if he leaves a lot of money on the table to leave. My point is, I don't know that at 29 a leopard's going to change his spot. What I'm saying is, is Westbrook you don't suddenly need. Gonna change? I, I wouldn't try to put superstars around it. I would put three and D guys. Did James Harden have superstars around him last year? No, he had three and D guys, and he had a great system in Mike what, that Mike D'Antoni created. That's what OKC needs. They need a coach that's going to create a great system for Westbrook, and they need role players who will be happy to defend, lock people up, spot up, shoot at the three point line, and rebound and let Russ be Russ. Now it may not let work. Let Russ. Be, I don't, it may I don't. not work because you have so many stack teams in the West. But I think that's the best route. Okay, to so get getting back to my question. Conference finals, Westbrook. If you if you don't want to say yes or no because you're afraid or what have you. Well, we'll see. Let, Let's well, see what look, people love to clip this stuff and put it online and be like, oh, you were wrong. What's the percentage chance Westbrook gets back to a conference it's finals? It's probably low. What it's probably low because the, the West is so strong. Three percent? No, no. I give you, Six? you know, fifteen percent, fifteen, twenty percent. Yeah. I mean, it depends. Like I said, they have to. It depends on what they put around him. Okay. But Westbrook is a first ballot Hall of Famer, iconic player. Who wouldn't want to be Allen Iverson? Yeah, I mean, everybody would, gets it. Would, would Skip Bayless be, said today on Undisputed, everybody gets in the NBA Hall of Fame. So uh, no, no, let's, no, no, let's no. take that. But there, there's there's a that. Hall of Fame, and then there's a Hall of Fame. Westbrook oh. will be in the Hall of Fame. Would you rather be Robert Ory or Allen Iverson? Uh, we're, let's save that for another day. Right, then. I don't then, then stop dissing that's a good question. individual I'm legends. Not dissing. And that's what Westbrook's uh, Westbrook going to be. Westbrook is great. He's going to be a Hall of Famer. He ain't winning. He ain't getting to a conference championship again. All right, my final, final take. Hot. It's, this is lukewarm. Uh, like most of them. Adi- <laughs> in addition to loving the OKC Thunder. You love you some Rockets. So they were just on Speak for Yourself today. You said the Rockets have a 30 to 35% chance of beating, of beating Golden State. I'm They're saying the right now. the best team in the league right now. Double zero. No chance. The Rockets, as of now, I mean, look, health pending. We'll see. I know you love to talk about injuries. No chance the Rockets take down the Warriors. Why? Why not? Oh, you want, you want me to explain yeah, myself? Yeah. Okay. So, number one, we've seen a worn down Warriors team. Draymond Green's missed some games. Kevin Durant has missed some games. Steph Curry is currently hurt. They're not at full strength. When they're trotting out Nick Young and Omri Caspi and our rookie Jordan Bell, we know Steve, Steve Kerr's tinkering. Okay, so that's the first point. Number two, we've seen this from Mike D'Antoni, Chris. He's a great, phenomenal regular season coach. Postseason? I don't know about that. We're going to find out. I also want to add the Warriors have faced James Harden in the playoffs twice. 
2015, 4 1. 2016, 4 1. And my final point, and, and, and there may be a point of contention here. I don't think you could go against the greatest backcourt of all time that you said last yeah. week and try to beat them at their game. I don't think you can try to beat the greatest shooting team in NBA history at their own game. I think you've got to come at it differently. I believe the Memphis Grizzlies a couple years ago pushed them. Now, this was pre-Durant. Really pushed them with Gasol, the big men, the passing. Kerr figured it out. Nobody last year even slowed down the Warriors in the postseason. I don't feel like the 15th best team in three-point shooting, the Rockets, is going to go toe-to-toe with the Warriors and push them in the conference finals. The Rockets currently have a top five offense of all time. So you can talk all you want about 15th rated percentage-wise in three-point shooting. Percentage, yeah. They're making, I believe, the most in the league. I'm just now curious, does Mike ton. D'Antoni responsible for, like, number two and number five all time? The Suns, are they no, all up there? No, I don't believe so. They're way ahead of the Suns. It's oh, Showtime, wow. Lakers, the Warriors. The Warriors of a couple years ago. Or, no, the Warriors of last year and the Warriors of this year. And then these Rockets. And to beat Golden State, because you're only going to slow – Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, and Klay Thompson down, but so much. So, <laughs> that. so that being the case, even if you play knockdown, drag out ba- basketball like Memphis or maybe even San Antonio would try, mm-hmm. you're going to have to score a certain number of points. I mean, they're only going to be slowed so much. So Houston, I think, is capable of doing that. They can score. Now, I do believe Steph Curry and Klay Thompson are the best starting backcourt of all time. All time. But right now, when you add in the bench and Eric Gordon averaging 19 points a game off the bench, those three, Gordon, Chris Paul, and James Harden, that's the best backcourt in the league right now. But that's just because unfa- Why is that unfair? That's, they're, they're all guards on the same team. That's a backcourt. Now, it's not starting backcourt, okay. but it's a, the, a trio of backcourt players. Uh, they also defend, and that's what – you're right, Mike D'Antoni, I'm with you. He has his lack of attention to detail yes. has cost his teams in the playoffs before. It cost uh, New York when he was there. It, not New York, it cost Phoenix, Phoenix when he was in Phoenix. And they, they always would have a bad mistake at a critical time, a lot of times against the Spurs. Yeah. But those Mike D'Antoni teams also didn't play defense. These now you playing. have a team that's playing defense. They're seventh ranked in the league in defensive efficiency. Warriors are second, Tucker. by the way. Yeah, yeah, Warriors play great defense. Look, and I'm still favoring the Warriors. I mean, if 30 to 35 percent, that means I'm hey, 65 to 75, 70 percent Warriors. So I'm with you on the Warriors, but I'm just saying this team looks like to me like they can play with the Warriors. I would favor Golden State, but I, I give them so a you, decent chance. A decent chance to win one game. Uh, no, let me ask you about them. James Harden's problems with the Warriors. I looked it up. Yeah. Four games last year against Golden State. Shot 31% from the field, 14% on three-pointers. By far the worst numbers Harden against anybody. That's the Klay Thompson factor. Klay Thompson is one of the best defensive shooting guards in the league. Well, he now, against Harden. Now I know what you're going to say. Now you got They'll Chris Paul to help. Ball. No, you got Chris Paul to help. If Chris they, Paul, if he, if he does defend Harden, he well, has to. I mean, you got Chris Harden Paul now to take a little pressure off. And and I'm concerned about Harden and Chris. They haven't been tremendous in the clutch. Chris has had his moments, but he's also had yeah. some bad. Well, moments let in the me. Uh, they've but been I'm great in the fourth quarter lately. Other, well, I'm talking about the playoffs. That's when it matters. Let's see if they bolster each other and give each other more confidence that they don't screw up in the clutch. But. Uh, I, Paul also gives them a mid-range game. Last year, they were very predictable. Uh, and those playoff matchups with Golden State in the past, they've been very predictable. Golden State's going to give you all the mid-range three. you want. Well, Take with, your twos. With, we're with going to make Rockets, threes. With, with the Rockets, what teams have done is force them. They know they're going to shoot a three, so they force them off the three-point line and, for, and into the paint. They want to go all the way yes. to the basket. They don't want to stop and take mid-range. Right. Now with Chris Paul, you got a guy that can stop and take mid-range. So now you can do it in the paint, mid-range, and Let me ask a quick X's and O's question. We got to wrap up. But you you said these three guards in Houston, Gordon and James and CP3. Who's guard in that lineup that you're talking about? Who's checking Kevin Durant? Well, those aren't. He's not a guard. See, that's that's the question. In the final five minutes, when the Warriors tried out the Hamptons five, 
What are the Rockets countering with? I don't. They don't have an answer. You for got PJ Tucker. Oh. Now I'm not. Nobody's locking up Kevin Durant. Exactly. But Trevor. Well, no, what? No, there's not a. Well, LeBron runs. couldn't stop him in the well, finals. That's what I'm saying. In the Nobody quarter. can lock and, him up. And that's the difference but here. If you you make. I just it gave tough. you the numbers. Clay locked up James Harden last year in Let's the four regular season games. Let's see if he locks him up games. this time. I don't think you'll lock You're him so up. You're so doubtful time. on Clay. Why are you so no, down I, on Clay? I, 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 I Clay's said a, he's a part of the Clay best Thompson backcourt in loves history. these debates, and that's why he's a fan of me. I see. You know, Splash <laughs> Brothers follow me on social media. I don't even think he knows your name. Oh, All right. probably not. Probably <laughs> Jason <not>. McIntyre, <laughs> Clay. Uh, but a job well done, Chris. Yeah, I know. Uh, this I, is I one know. of your more. I, I, it's the holidays. I'm in a generous feeling. I wanted to give him a shot at that Kobe Bryant stuff. Oh my goodness. You you know I you know I beat you up badly on that. Duncan. You know I beat Duncan, you up badly dog. on that. Come on. But good job. Knock good down job. Jay. My man Jason McIntyre. He tries hard. I give him an A for effort. D, I'll take the A. D plus <laughs> for execution. But hopefully you enjoyed it and join us next week. We had a great show with Ralph Sampson. My man, Jay Mack, and of course, the definitive top 10 NBA players of all time. Check us out on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and SoundCloud, and leave us five stars and a friendly comment for In The Zone. We'll check you out next week. Oh, happy holidays.